I'm Rosalie Dobell, the Associate Curator of Talks. Um, it's a real, very special pleasure to welcome this evening uh, two figures who need little introduction. Uh, New York artist Carly Schneeman is back with us for the first time since 1968, and she's joined by London-based art historian, critic and curator Alison Green, um, an academic who's written at length on Carly's work. This evening, the pair will discuss Carolee's long-spanning practice ahead of the opening of her first UK solo show, Water Light, Water Needle, opening at Hales on Friday. I'd also like to thank very much all at Hales for your support on this event. So for the format, Carolee and Alison will talk for around an hour, and then we'll have a chance for a question and answer session. Um, after this event at 8.40, we're screening Breaking the Frame, a documentary portrait of Cara Lee, and tickets of this can be bought after this event at the box office. And so, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Alison and ask you to join me in welcoming our guests to the stage. It's, it's absolutely with great pleasure that, that I'm here to really to help Carly or to speak about um, Carly's work or to join her in a conversation about it. Um, so first off, I wanted to say that if um, during the talk, if anybody has a question, please feel free to break in because I think we want to, to be more potentially more interactive than just us speaking for an hour. Um, but if you do, just raise your hand and wave it and um, Rosalie or somebody from the ICA will hand you a microphone because it is being recorded, so we want that to be captured. Um, so uh, I'm just going to say a few, a few words to start um, and then we've, Carolee and I have picked uh, six works to talk about and so we have those to, to speak about, including Water Light, Water Needle, and a number of works that Carly made in England, and some recent ones. I also want to say that we want all of you to stay for the film. Yes. <laughs> the it's incredible, unbelievable. The film is amazing. I, I did see it last year as well. Um, so we're staying, and we hope that you do too. So just before just before we end, we're going to just also include a little a little chat about the the film. So um, just briefly, I thought I would um, maybe talk about, talk to a couple points that I think for myself have been uh, instructive or uh, um, inspirational in thinking about Carolee's work. And um, I'll start out by saying, as it is with these things, I came, came upon, um, I knew of her work, of course, reading about art history as an undergraduate, um, but uh, about six or seven years ago, I was working on a research project that had to do with uh, American art around 1959, 1960, and I came across a review of your exhibition at PPOW, which was of early paintings and um, and uh, assemblages. And it uh, was one of those moments where you said, first of all, I never thought that, of course, Carolee had started out as anything other than a performance artist. So to sort of think about um, Carolee as a painter and leaving, stopping painting and doing something else seemed very important in that moment. So um, in a sense, to uh, think about what would motivate somebody to stop making you know, gestures on a canvas or producing images in that way and seek other ways of uh, making work seemed Fund fundamental. Um, so then thinking across, as I started to do, of course, much more reading and um, started to talk to Carolee about her work, it struck me that it was really important that Carolee worked with technology um, in a way that complicated issues of sort of uh, pr uh, presentation and representation. And that was there right from the, the beginning. And so if, if somehow performance art seems to favor the idea of a live body, there was something else going on that had to do with the fact that Carolee made films and she used various recording devices to capture things from the world and bring them into works in various ways, that she made performances for camera, that she did these um, kinetic theater uh, projects. And this was, this was really important. The other thing seemed really important was to think about Carolee's work through uh, a lens of politics, and I think that's really comes out 
strongly in her 1960s work all the, and her work all the way to the present. Um, so the last one I wanted to mention was also, and I explored this recently in a piece of writing, the idea of it being autobiographical or the idea of sort of life writing and that um, intersection between a, a, a kind of the making of work and that being deeply sort of impl implicated in. Sorry, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sort of having to do with the work and the life working together in, in very um, complex ways. So that's just a really brief overview of different points which I felt were, um, were useful but also only partially so. So um, this is in a way why I think the work is something that I come back to and uh, find really compelling to think about. Um, so as I mentioned, we've chosen six works to talk about, and we're going to start with this one called Roundhouse. And actually, I'm going to refer to the gentleman who just told me to speak up. When I uh, start with the question or the proposition that um, Joe Burke described Roundhouse, and this was um, a performance Carly did in the summer of 1967 in London. He described it as a project of subversive re-education. Uh, do we have any painterly image in our 12 little units, do you know? Can you remember, should we flash through? We don't have anything earlier. No. no, I wanted to establish the basic premise that I will always describe myself, no matter how tangled up in material, as a painter. I'm a painter, I'm a painter. All my visual disciplines, all my ideas for extending gesture into space and into real time come from my training, my experience, my bedrock, uh, perceptual disciplines as a painter. Everything came out of painting for me, and the fact that the painting has been uh, obscured by my use of the body is a constant trouble and irony for me. And what I've been saying lately is my use of the body um, obscured the source of the imagery which comes from painting and those traditions. and. To specify it, I could mention uh, Velazquez's use of the brush, those intensive strokes. And growing up, coming into the art world, I became aware that the brush stroke itself was a visual event, and that I wanted to heighten and uh, deepen structures of the visual event. But if I go back to the stroke of painting, I go back to Cezanne's Broken Line. Those are my influences, along with Artaud and uh, Beauvoir, in terms of feminist history, feminist suppressions, feminist uh, displacements. So before I can get to the Roundhouse, um, which is a work made possible by the invitation of Dr. Joe Burke here, still in London, who was the founder of the anti-psychiatrists. Um, uh, Alison, say again the quote from Joe, what it was. It was described, and this is in More Than Meat Joy, as a project of subversive re-education, and that referred to the whole Congress, right? And what I was able to do was to activate the language of the Congress, to re-record it, <coughs> and to work with um, a group of participants who wanted to physicalize their sense of issues and presence and participation. It's important to remember that this was done with immense resistance from uh, most of the organizers with the exception of Joe Burke who brought me out. R.D. Lang detested me on sight. <laughs> uh, yeah, I looked like, um, uh, something sexually impossible that would not be under his control, and his unconscious presence was 
Hostel. Um, Joe, what was the other guy? Goodman, Paul Goodman? Famous erotic sexual um, radical psychiatrist, right? David Cooper. David was nice. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Gregory Bateson was kind and thoughtful. But um, what's the one I just said? Thinking of Alan Krebs? What? Alan You're thinking Krebs. of Alan Krebs? Alan Krebs? Don't remember any trouble with him. He wasn't around. <laughs> but uh, Goodman actually stood up at the first meeting and said that he uh, had nothing to do with inviting this young woman, and he didn't want her recording their theories or discussing them. Uh, he was disturbed that I was taking attention and focus. So it was a nightmare for me when they had a dialectics party and they were all guys <laughs> they would send me to the east end because I didn't know better the party was in Hempstead of course and they would send me to E13 uh, <laughs> lost in the tubes so it was stressful so so the majority of the Congress it was sort of one to two weeks and it was mainly people talking and you know arguing over things and sort of panel discussions and the like but your could you describe what's going on with your oh, performance brilliant activists at the time Stokely Carmichael Joe Burke R.D. Lang uh, Bateson Cooper they were all very uh, powerful uh, Alan Ginsburg. what Alan Ginsburg. Ginsburg yeah Ginsburg yeah hmm uh, anyway, it was a deeply bonded male set of contentions that they wanted to examine together. Um, with my troop and my group, I was able to bring in um, a cart with two horses in one sequence to drag away bodies while the text of the conference was being collaged um, in a uh, over uh, sound projections. It was a luscious, fierce, visceral activation based on the themes of the dialectics. And at the end, um, Fuses was screened, is that right? Well, Fuses, <coughs> my self-shot erotic film that's from 65, uh, Joe definitely wanted it screened, but the organizers phoned their attorney and took me aside out back near a pile of garbage at the roundhouse and said, um, if you screen the film fuses and you are arrested on pornography, we will not help you. Do not expect the backers of the Dialectics of Liberation to do anything for you at all. <laughs> Joe, remember that? I don't. Oh, well, okay. Um. So should, like, can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, we're still in London, yeah. So actually, Carly, you're back in London. I'm back, yes. You're back in London, and this is a <coughs> performance that was at the National, um, the National Film Theatre, and it was really the moment in which underground cinema in London sort of made its sort of debut. Um, well, it was disturbing. Mm -hmm because I was building images to counter the, um, something about the rigidity of projection, of the containment of filmic action within the frame, the demands for the specificity of projection time, and the demands for the audience to be um, focused on this virtuality. So I wanted to disturb the virtuality of the activist film with the performative uh, sequence. And can you talk a little bit more about kinetic theater and the pr the principles that you were working with with this with the with the performers and the well the physicality of the nude work is also extended. Uh, to disrupt the expectations of the audience with these, um, what did we call them in the 60s? Front row, help me, we blew up plastic, plastic inevitables, plastic... Infl inflatables? Inflatables, thank you, yeah. Uh, so we, we had a huge 
uh, blowing machine <coughs> and these uh, <coughs> large amounts of plastic that we could blow up to the extent that they would force the audience out of the space. That was <laughs> exciting. And uh, so <coughs> after the naked actions, these balloons began to extend over and onto and all around the audience and they would get up and quite logically decide to escape this intrusion. Um, so yes, all of this can be traced back to abstract expressionism and uh, the dynamic field of activity <coughs> which you could say um, you must pinpoint with Pollock. You mentioned, Alison mentioned, <coughs> telling the beginning, uh, it was extremely disturbing for me at the University of Illinois in graduate school, where I'm in essence a landscape painter, uh, to feel that painting was not going to sustain itself. Um, it's a very dark existential young artist situation. and. During this time, my partner, Jim Tenney, and I lived in a kind of shack outside of Champaign-Urbana because it was surrounded by trees and water. And indeed, um, what came through? Not a hurricane, a tornado, yeah. A tornado came through and smashed a big, beautiful tree of heaven through our kitchen window and into the sink. And our landlord was 80 eight years old and we knew any problem would be very difficult to solve. And uh, here was the kitchen sort of mutilated, but my cat, our cat, Kitch, carefully studied this intrusion of the branches into the sink and saw an immediate uh, transgressive motion where no doors had to be open. She could walk right out on these branches and enter her landscape. And then she could return on these smashed branches right into the kitchen sink. And I watched this and my distress abated because I thought that's what I want. I want to do what she's doing. I want that disturbed space where there's an instantaneous possibility for motion. And I invited a group of students to come on a Sunday and gave them cards to crawl, to climb, to go in the mud, to go in the water, uh, to follow everything broken and make a physical journey. And that's how performance began for me. Yeah, that's incredible. And, and so that was sort of a principle that was brought over to these group performances and we'll come back to that when we get to the image for water light, water needle. But also in this, it was important there was live music and there was uh, film. Music? Yes. What music? Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a fan it of... It was... I don't like decorative <coughs> accompanying music. What was it? What was it? They're not allowed to know yet. Wait a minute. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's John Lifton's music, which was not exactly traditional music. He right. would have been working <laughs> with related sounds of uh, scratching and blowing and plastic scraping, but organized in a powerful magic. Uh, yeah, John Lifton <coughs> and I were collaborating during my early years in London. Uh, and I was also, for part of that time, living in a tent he built in the filmmaker's place. Um, where was that? Verity, where, where was it? Felicity, where was that tent? Uh, what? Uh, it was in Camden Town, Lower Camden Town. It was the filmmakers cooperative before they <coughs> really had their own space. It was an old, um, I think it was another uh, milk, <laughs> another dairy, yeah. Yeah, before they went to the other dairy. <laughs> So that's good to be precise as it was sound, not music. Yeah. 
and and fi and film projection and projections of images. So there's a in this work. Yeah. Well, she studied it. I just I don't know. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> so trust her. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the next one, please. Okay. Fantastic. So this is um this is some images from. Uh, a work called Water Light, Water Needle, and this is um, what's being shown at Hale's Gallery right now. And I, again, I was thinking about the way, um, the way in your work, there are ways in which you work on something and then you work on it again and then you work on it again. So Water Light, Water Needle was, uh, came from an idea that you had in Venice and then you made a performance uh, of it in St. Mark's Church in New York. And then the images that we're looking at here is a, it was sort of reorganized and, and enacted in a, uh, on a sort of derelict country estate in New Jersey. Yeah, and the it was owned by the Havemeyers. They're the collectors who brought Impressionist works to the Metropolitan Museum. Um, this was an amazing coincidence that Water Light, Water Needle was inspired by the amazing um, gravitational pull of sky to water, to wetness, to dryness, to land being dissolved into waterways. It was um, hypnotic for me when I first was there, and I wanted, from having been in Venice, to build the sensations of suspension and motion um, on the ropes. And St. Mark's Church in New York agreed to this, to my building uh, metal struts and hammering them in. I had to have pillars to realize the rope structure. There was no insurance in those days. The audience was seated directly under the ropes precariously. Um, and then I wanted to do it outside, and we had no money and no place, and there was a kid who had been helping rig the ropes uh, named Ferdi, and Ferdi said, I might know a place in the countryside. And I said, well, we have to go right away. We'll get a truck, we have to go tomorrow. And he said, well, my father is a Venetian psychiatrist, I love this, and he's buying this abandoned estate that turned out to be from the Havemeyers. So Mary Cassatt and Mary Havemeyer are best friends, privileged, wealthy, young artists. They go to Paris, and Cassatt convinces Havemeyer that her father, Sugar Money, should bring back all his paintings. So I end up on the Havemeyer estate. <laughs> And you found this perfect set of trees that the ropes could be attached to. And, and this photographers helping to um, document the work. And this time as well, there was film taken, right? Quite a bit of film. So it was only in the past five years that I was able to uh, re-edit, remaster the footage because I finally had uh, equipment at Electronic Arts Intermix in New York City and an amazing collaborative editor, um, uh, Shimitsu. So this is what we're going to be able to show at Hales. And of course, it's never, ever been seen in this formulation. It's, it's, it's quite exciting for me, and it looks good. So come. <laughs> yes, here's a question. Let's wait for a mic, if you don't mind. Did you say that this was first performed in a church? Why, why, why in a church? I was very curious about that. Why did we end up in a church? Because they were completely risk-taking. They, in the 60s, uh, St. Mark's and Judson Church wanted to serve their community. That became a principle. Their communities consisted of um, drug addicts, poets, artists, homeless people, and, and they took these wonderful cultural risks, subsequently um, working with AIDS patients. So it was uh, a, a rare configuration for the time. Thank you, that's interesting. Well, I, I should 
should mention the church in London that we ruined, right? Yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we have any images of me, Joy, at 64. It's the first time I get to Europe. 1964, Jean-Jacques Lebel in Paris is organizing a festival of free expression. And uh, the artist, the Icelandic artist, Eero, has filmed a physical transformation set for me, I bought it, and he says, you have to go there. This is gonna be wonderful. Uh, I guess I'm 24, 25, I really wanna go. I have no money. Uh, Armand, the artist, buys one of my best works for exactly one way on Icelandic Airlines. Mm -hmm. And my father gives me some French money, but it's from Mauritania or somewhere. <laughs> so I end up in Paris, penniless, with not a, even a jeton to make a phone call to Jean-Jacques, who really hoped I would never turn up. And uh, so what was the point of this story about Meet Joy? When Meet Joy was performed in London, it was in a church. <laughs> the first experience in London. It's interesting. It's interesting. Michael White, you've probably heard of him. He was our kid producer. He did, uh, Meet Joy in Paris was extraordinary. Uh, it was on every front page. Um, everybody famous in Paris was there. It was ecstatic. It was fabulous. And then Jean Jacques said, well, let's take it to London. And Michael White, another kid, got us a church in, Joe, where was that? Do you remember? It's, it's I believe it was in Pimlico, although I've never been Victoria. able to find it. It was yes. near Victoria. It was a, a church again. Judson, Judson Church, wasn't it? No, we're talking about London. Oh, and it yeah. was... Um, well, London goes completely wrong. It the has guy a funny... Everything was wrong. The performers ended up being a bunch of girls with hockey sticks who didn't really want to do it. My lead <laughs> man turned up utterly drunk. He couldn't even do the sensitive, sensuous walk. Uh, and then at some point, there are other events combined with it, and one of my chickens got stuck. It was a priory, got stuck in a sink. And so all this bloody chicken parts started to flow out into the hallway of the Priory, at which point um, the minister freaked out, he would say, and said, this has to stop, this has to be cleaned up, you have to get out of here. And some one of our group put him in his elevator, sent him up to the top of the church and locked him up there, <laughs> uh, at which point he called the police and um, Mark Boyle was helping our group. He, he grabbed me and said, we have to get out of here. He put me in some car and threw a blanket over me. And uh, we drove around and around. And then we ended up at the pub right behind the church, hearing the sirens. Um, so that was London. <laughs> so if we could have the next slide, please. Oh, back in London. This is good. So we really felt that it was important to talk about this um, event, performance that Carly did at here at the ICA in 1968, June 1968. And it's well known uh, amongst your works, but I, no, I don't think so. Really? I don't think it's well known. Okay. It's a naked but action lecture, and I, I feel, I mean, Russ, we, we have to kind of bring it home, as it were, but um, I, I kind of always wonder what you talked about. I was lecturing on Cezanne. Right. Uh, I was dressed in farmer's overalls and nothing underneath but a lot of oranges in the pockets. And, um, what? Was that here? It was the next room over. Yes, it was here. Yeah, it's almost exactly this space, but not quite. Um, I wanted to ask the question, could an artist be an art historian and a visual nude? And of course the question was uh, seen as something purient and uh, improper. But I was lecturing about Cezanne and the influence of the articulated plane, the articulated um, forms, of landscape and still life, 
and Cezanne's broken line through which I envisioned um, performative actions. And while I was lecturing, I was showing slides of Cezanne's work and uh, getting out of my overalls and throwing the oranges into the audience. And then you got two volunteers from the audience. Yes. And you made a, uh, the way I've read about it is that you demonstrated the principles of collage. Yes. I had uh, my boyfriend at the time cover me with wall pa wallpaper paste. And then I prepared um, a great pile of newspaper off the edge of the performance stage and invited um, people from the audience, two or three, to come up and cover me completely with wallpaper paste and to push me off the stage into the pile of paper. And that concluded the lecture. <laughs> and how was the response to that? Oh, people were disgusted. <laughs> you know, early London audience, um, there was an old colonel who said only a deranged nymphomaniac could do such a work. It was not a positive response. So I think there's something in there as well as this idea of being able to produce a, you drop the H off the word history and you called it an art history, a way of thinking about a kind of feminist reading of, of, uh, well, of it history. It was a rather desperate moment to try to reintegrate principles of women's art making. And the resistance was so um, culturally intensive and pervasive. Those were years when men could say, without any shame, a woman painting is like a monkey playing a violin. Uh, I was constantly told I could do whatever I wanted, but it wouldn't mean anything. Or it would be, um, some strange marginalia. So I had constantly the sense of what I called breaking through the vivid walls of masculine culture. It seems really beautiful, the idea of standing up in that authoritative position, narrating this history, as it were, but then taking your clothes off and seeing how that changed the yes, situation. So, so, you know, what can you accept from this presentation. Can you accept the theory, which is part of your culture? Can you accept this naked lecturer who is completely in contradistinction to the expectations for female presence? Yeah. Okay, next slide. Um, Thank you. It's very old fashioned. So, um, because we didn't want to just stay in the past, we wanted to bring in a few recent works, and this is a work from 2000, well, 2000, 2005, called Terminal Velocity. Keep your mic up. Keep my mic up. But that, is this working? Yes? Um, and it was made quite clearly in response to the, um, to the attack on the World, World Trade, Trade Center. Centers. Yeah. And I was wondering if you would talk about the politics of these images? Well, I wanted to get as close to the falling bodies visually as I could. I didn't exactly know why. It was a sense of intimacy and an in memoriam. And I was one of the early people who be believed from the very first moment, the very first moment, that my government had to be culpable in this. That these guys in the airplanes weren't able to get through all our protective structures unless there was collusion. Uh, and then the question always was, why this sacrifice? What was this bringing to the government? Why was this going to be uh, an essential um, deformation of our righteous principles? So when I'm working with these images, what this is what I'm thinking about and concentrating on. And I wanted to, <coughs> and they're really very simple. I, if, if I use um, computer images, the images dissolve. That's um, 
the pixel, no, the, um, not the pixel. If I work with newspaper print, I have a pixel that I can keep enlarging and enlarging and blow up. But I can't work with uh, video material for the degree of enlarging. So since newspaper clippings, uh, I have to find them before the power and politics represses them, so they disappear. It was a very simple work, and I wanted to make it uh, so that when you stood in front of it, it was overwhelming. So I, I wondered whether we can return to that idea of an history. Is there anything? Because I was thinking this is a kind of his, this is a work that's trying to take on kind of history as it's happening. Well, I've gone back to the age of history because the dropping the age was appropriate at a certain moment of feminist redefinitions of everything, but then it <laughs> becomes um, cumbersome. I think we all begin to understand that history, even though it's his all over again, is um, full of uh, female enactment and analysis. Right, do you think? Or should we go back to dropping the H? <laughs> and if we could move, I think this is our last <coughs> image, it should be. If we could switch to the next slide. Thanks, great. So is this your most recent work? Yes. Great. Except for this is the most recent constructed work with the exception of um, the water light, water needle installation at Hal's gallery that we put, built, you know, and structured this week. Yeah, there's a question. Are you just stretching? Are you stretching or is that an arm up? <laughs> stretching, okay. <laughs> um, this is a complex work, obviously. Flange, six RPM. Six RPM is the speed at which I've motorized my work since the 60s when I motorized uh, sequences of umbrella umbrellas in painting constructions. The six RPM seems to be um, the motion that I need. This work began uh, with just walking in the street and seeing something almost like an arm moving around. I thought, well, what's that about? Um, strange, so I went home and started drawing it. And then I saw it would be um, sculptural elements that I would call flanges. And so I began to, each one is uh, uniquely constructed. It's a wax, lost wax process. And then I found a student doing kinetic work and I said, these arms have to move. They have to go back and forth. And uh, how do we do that? So I made a lot of drawings and we got some computer and motorized systems for them. Yeah. Uh, it, it happened very smoothly somehow. Once I had all the um, lost wax flanges, I had a student working in a foundry and this saved my life because we took these units and poured them in the foundry, burnt them out, and poured them into forms of aluminum. And heavy aluminum that I wasn't going to polish. I wanted it gritty. And then I wanted the projection to be of the burning. So when you walk into the space, you're really enveloped with the sense of uh, flaming. And the sound is only the flange is moving on their motors, yeah. Should we talk a little bit about the film and then take some questions? The film is absolutely exquisite, fantastic. If you want to know anything, anything about me, it's all there. <laughs> it's uh, a collaboration with Marielle Mituslavska, <coughs> who worked for six years um, just entering all the work I've made. I never questioned her. She'd be in my diaries. She'd be in my photographic albums. She'd follow exhibits that I was in to LA. 
There's an amazing sequence from the feminist uh, history exhibit called Whack that was in Los Angeles. It's, it's, it's just such a remarkable work. I'm very blessed with it. Yeah, so I hope you'll see it. So I think it would be great to take some questions from the audience. And there is a hand in the back. Thank you. It sounds like you. It sounds like you had a very hostile experience in London in the late 60s, early 70s. And um, I wondered whether from your, your tent at the London Filmmakers Co-op or and I, that you actually ever found any uh, perhaps uh, female kindred spirits or feminist kindred spirits to keep your spirits up? Yes, yes, thank you. It's a good question. Some of them are sitting right here. Uh, and, you know, we very deeply shared the processes and the contentions surrounding each other's work. Um, the male film artists were friends, but they were friends with qualifications so that they were the central definition and the central force for uh, the creative issues of film in the 60s and 70s. As far as I experienced it, did you guys have any exception to that? They're laughing, so <laughs> no, okay. Uh, but I loved London. London was good to me. I arrived here in a very uh, broken down state. My uh, deep relationship was fractured. The Vietnam War never ended. Uh, people were just losing it at that time. It was um, very common for people just to kind of go nuts. Communes dissolved, work was not realized. The cultural pressures were so um, contradictory. But London, in some essence, was welcoming. Even the police who were given instructions to check on all these expatriates, what were they really up to, they were very nice and polite. And they'd come to the door and say, I'm terribly sorry, miss, but if you don't mind too much, would you mind terribly coming up to the Hampstead police station um, to fill out some necessary forms? So, OK, all right, you know. Um, the, is it MI5? M5, they were watching us. Subsequently, we found all these records. They were monitoring all our phone calls, but it was done with such a gracious, good... <laughs> <laughs> we, we all survived and did well, yeah. Okay, more questions, please. Okay, right here. Very interesting, thank you. I was actually, um, used to go to the arts lab and I used to go. I, I used to go to the arts lab oh. in Drury Lane. Yeah, I'm older than I look, <laughs> and I remember fuses being screened there. So I question whether that. I think that was where the underground happened, even though it was quite male dominated. It branched out later, I'm sure. But I'm quite interested. What my my, my interest, not just the arts lab and on all the things that were happening there. It's really what you think about reimagination and recreating of your works because this is what I'm looking at the moment because this is part of my recent past and I feel as though Fuses is my work of art as well as your work of art because I was there and experiencing it so I'm looking in retrospect what my experience was, was of that and also whether there's anything wrong with reimagining and recreating that kind of work because you have actually spoken up against that but that you're starting to recreate aren't you? So, oh yeah, but, right. but there's a big qualification to that. Um, influence, we all influence each other. We need one another's work to inspire us mm. and give us permission. But the permission and the inspiration needs to lead to something fresh and vital and not simply an imitation or reformulation. Uh, for instance, interior scroll, it seems to be done by at least four freshmen out of every art class <laughs> every year. Uh, <laughs> naked, dressed, using ketchup or blood. They're endless, and guys like to do it also in their own way. Um, <laughs> so there needs to be a point where certain influences get exhausted and lead to something 
unique. I would say that uh, Lady <coughs> Gaga is a very good example of reincorporating some of my principles. <laughs> yeah. mm. And uh, well, with all the variations, there's a, you might know about this on YouTube. There's a young woman one winter night recently in Buffalo who set her camera up in the bathroom in black and white and said to the camera, I'm going to eat my Tampax, and I don't know why. And she pulled a, a bloody Tampax out and eats it for the camera. And I got a call from London, actually. Some journalist said, you have to see this and say what you think. And I, I knew he wanted me to be outraged and say, well, this is going really too far. I thought, <laughs> oh, I said, it's very tender. This is very beautiful. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an intense intimacy. You couldn't get any closer to yourself than that. Mm. So you're talking about the honesty of the recreation. You, you're saying that some of it's very derivative. Yes, it was, it's a, you know, yeah. it's so important. She a bit said, fetishistic, she says, I don't yeah. know why I'm doing this. It's mm. coming from a very deep, unknown necessity. It's mm. fresh, it's fresh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. yeah. wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, you mentioned that a few of your pieces have taken place in churches and um, you spoke about that already, but um, I also feel like in looking at some of your previous works, a very deep spirituality to them. And I wonder whether you see the role of religion or ritual at all in your works or if you feel that they are separate from those traditional um, structures. Yeah, that's and uh, thank you for that question. I think uh, I commend the work to a spirituality always, and of course, it's a it's really the most taboo thing about my work because in this culture. Anything paranormal, anything dealing with invisible layers of experience or insight, uh, it will be used to trivialize what you finally do make. It's a materialistic, a very harsh psychodynamic in our culture. It wants proof, it wants evidence. And as soon as you say, I'm shaping um, the presence of my life with an intense illness due to finding a group of feathers. And because of the feathers that I found, I am refusing traditional um, oncology. What am I going to do with that? That's, that's what I need. And I would say I love the question and I base my ability to work and to conceive of the work on a set of um, indescribable spirit aspects. Yes, yes. You can't teach that, you know, I can't tell my class, now you gotta get your spirit aspects. Uh, they're all chock full of horrible semiotic crap. I mean, <laughs> l l let's move that first. <laughs> Hi, yes, it's not a question so much as a comment, but maybe you can say something about it. I think the most powerful anti-war film I've ever seen is your Viet Flakes. And it has that quality of intimacy that you've just described in relation to the young woman who's produced recent work. Um, because it seems to suggest the intimate lives of the women and children who are being affected, or the families who are being affected by war. Do you feel the same? It's about the quality of intimacy that you value and the way that that comes through in Viet Flakes and how powerfully anti-war that is as a comment. Yeah, thank you. I think that's that's part of the shameless address that I have to um, let it be. I'm still very upset by that film, very. I can deal with all my work, but that film 
It just puts me over the edge, and that's what I needed to do. It's correct. Yeah. And I should say that terminal velocity um, had fierce, hostile reactions. It was probably shown too soon. When it was first in my gallery in New York, they, uh, people, probably not so much in the art world, came in and uh, tore signage and wrote obscenities because they felt that this was an artist taking advantage of a tragedy and that the artist would try to sell these images uh, for her own good. So I subsequently had to write uh, a little statement stating my purpose and that it was an in, an in memoriam and a dedication to the images of these people who had lost their lives um, not by choice, by being blown out the window, or by falling through the space. Yeah. Um, bodies, and in particular your body, have been part of your work for a long time, and I just wondered if you might be willing to say a few words about how your relationship with your own body has changed in relation to the work as you've grown older. Yeah, that's a traditional question now. Now that you're not perfect and young, what are you doing with that body? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's not what I meant. But <laughs> well, I haven't done any performance work since 1975? 77? Yeah, I stopped using the body as uh, essential material in the 70s, uh, up to including her limits, was really the last time that I wanted to physicalize my images. Um, so the inevitable question is that I have all these other materials that I want to struggle with. And so going back to kinetic machinery and motors, it's an aspect of the body, but it's not the overt explicit body. And there are some women artists who continue to bravely use their body into uh, their death throes, and I would mention Hannah Wilkie's cancer images, which finally stabilized the importance of her work that she was not a narcissist, because once she was using her body ruined by chemo and surgery, it had the same determinants, the same principles of when she used her body and it was young and beautiful. I'd just say, Carolee, you were splendid in the restaging of Meat Joy at the White Chapel that was much later oh, than you. what she really? said. I everybody hated it. Thank you. No, well, no, the people I hated were the weedy art students who didn't really get into the whole thing properly. But uh, no, you were splendid. And it was a really important moment much, much later than you're saying. So I'm all for you going on and on. But my question, which is rather banal in one way, but you're actually extending your body into these pieces, is you never said what these things whooshing around in the street actually were. What, what were they that inspired you? I will never say. <laughs> oh. They are flange. And when I oh. first started to envision them, I walked around for weeks aiding, you know, asking all my friends, have you seen a sculpture with things going round and round and back and forth? Because sometimes I'm not sure that it isn't someone else's imagery. So I have to wait until everyone says, no, I think it's yours. <laughs> um, I also have a wonderful recent motorized work called Flange. You will see it in the film tonight by Marielle Nitoslavska. Uh, it's these little white coats uh, moving up and down. They're like, yeah, they're like these white forms. I have no idea what Flange is about, but that's fine. We have time for a couple of more, if there are, if we have any more. Okay, yeah, right there in the <coughs> middle. Thank you. Um, I came across your work through reading about John Cage, as I'm a musician, and I, I don't know whether this is important to you or not, but can I ask how important or not music has ever been, or if that has been an influence in some of your work? Excellent question. 
um, all of my work from the late 50s until 1969 when we separated was influenced by the musician, my partner, James Tenney. And um, going through graduate school and living in these tiny, tight places with Jim studying and pounding out the chords of the Concord Sonata over and over again, or other works of Ives or Webern or Schoenberg, it was a tremendous influence for me to uh, fragment, to let the visual dissonance happen, um, to break form and pull it together. And we did that for one another consistently. And it was wonderful, it was thrilling. So if he was working with John Cage, we were going together to get mushrooms. When he wanted to work with Edgar Varez, Varez hired me as his um, kind of archivist to clip out all the reviews and glue them on a better piece of paper. It was such a coherent, and, and Jim is in all these early performances as well as inspiring fuses. There's an amazing new uh, biography of Tenney coming out eventually by Eric Smigel, S-M-I-G-E-L. I sort of, in the reading and the talking to you that I did about um, the 1960s, it was really like uh, Carly and Jim were on an adventure together and it included so many correspondences between, between their distinct body of works, but also the moments in which they collaborated and learned from each other deeply. It was actually fundamental. It's a really good question. So we can say the book is the So the book about uh, James Tenney is going to, going to be called The Wonder of It All. Oh, well, OK. So I, I should say something about also about breaking the frame all the sound is the music of James Tenney. It's not programmatic, it's in uh, broken sections. Editing is done to it and with it. It's quite beautiful and extraordinary. And part of making it work so well was uh, Jim's widow, Lauren Pratt Tenney, after we were no longer together, became my closest friend. And I introduced them and put them together. So in order to really um, complete the sound for breaking the frame, Lauren Pratt Tenney collaborates with uh, Mariella with me. It's great. It's good. OK, how about one, one more? Yeah. Here we go in the back. Hi. And you mentioned about um, a time when things started to break down and people were going nuts. and. I guess I always looked at your work as part of a wider movement at that time. And I wonder if you could maybe talk about what that movement meant for you and what happened to it, and maybe how you see other movements now, maybe re-appreciating that time and how we can, I guess, um, invent for ourselves, but also make a connection. Well, I think when you're really young, you don't know you're part of a movement. You're fascinated, you have friends that, um, you share principles with and experiments with. So there was the Fluxus bunch, and uh, we were all close. Um, there were some of the wonderful painters. Rauschenberg in New York, when he sold a work, gave a big party, invited everybody to eat and drink and smoke, whatever they wanted, it was fabulous. You'd go home and you had chocolate cake and sausages smashed in your pocket, <laughs> uh, so generous. The Judson Church, I, I work very closely with the Judson dancers, and now they're all renowned. We didn't know they'd all become so famous, even though we intended to transform the culture we inherited. Um, well, we all knew each other, you know. We went into parties for Warhol, and uh, Yoko wanted to photograph all our behinds, so we went up there. Um, it was a very concise and varied time. Now it's completely spread out. It's much too much for me. I stay home in the country as much as I can uh, just to concentrate on what I need to know. So I'm missing these new movements. And I'm hoping all of you will 
make them clear and vibrant. <laughs> I think that's a lovely note to end on. So if you'll join me in thanking Carolee for coming. Thank you.